Ah, perfect. Go ahead. All right. Uh, well, again, my name is Abby Johnson. Uh, my advisor is Jennifer Glass, and I am in the uh, Ocean Science and Engineering PhD program. I'm actually the first cohort of that program, and I'm now in my fifth year. So I am actually defending in April. Uh, so this is my last Explorigens. I've had a great time, uh, and I look forward to seeing where this program goes in the future. So first, gas clathrates are also known as uh, gas hydrates, and these are pages of water molecules that trap guest gas molecules. So methane clathrates or methane hydrates are cages of water molecules that trap guest methane molecules. And, and so these structures form under high pressure and low temperature and where there's plenty of gas. And on the left, you can see the structure of a methane clathrate. Uh, it kind of looks like water ice. Um, it has similar physical properties as uh, water ice. It probably tastes like water ice, except it's flammable and only is stable at high pressures. Methane clathrates are found along continental margins in and under the perm uh, in and under permafrost, excuse me, and that's represented by this darker blue color right along the continental margins. And in this little bar graph, you can see that there are gigatons more uh, gas coming from the gas clathrates than our current fossil fuel reserves. So they're um, a point uh, Hi, Abigail. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Uh, nope. Unfortunately, it looks like online your slides aren't cycling. Would you mind okay. stopping sharing and then sharing it again? Thanks. No worries. Let's try again. Uh, here, let's go with that. I tried a different share mode, so hopefully that helps. Do you just uh, double check going to the next slide and then oh, coming yeah. back? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Okay, it looks like on blue jeans it might be working. And okay. let me just double check. I don't know if that's working on YouTube just yet. Okay. Ah, perfect. Now that's working. Thanks so much for your patience. Yeah, of course. That's why we have a little buffer time. All right, can I go? You're good to go. Awesome. All right. Um, and so I'll just briefly repeat myself that the uh, figure on the right is a map of where uh, methane clathrates are found. Um, and there's that bar graph in the bottom left uh, showing that gas from gas clathrates store gigatons more um, carbon than our other uh, fossil fuel reserves, which um, means that gas clathrates are a point of interest for energy utilization. And on the left is just a pretty picture of methane clathrate. And what y'all are probably most interested in is that methane clathrates are predicted to be on other planetary bodies. And on the left, you can see the possible methane sources and sinks on Mars. And there's this nice methane clathrate storage predicted to be in the subsurface. And the methane coming um, to that is perhaps sourced from some sort of methanogenesis or perhaps a water rock reaction called serpentinization. Um, they're, they're also predicted to be on uh, Pluto, and you can see the schematic of the cross section where there's a clathrate hydrate uh, layer that caps and actually stabilizes a subsurface ocean. Uh, so back here on Earth, we have this um, pretty big issue where natural gas clathrates actually clog, clog natural gas pipelines. Um, and this is pretty, can be pretty tragic. It was the cause of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, and so some of the solutions that we use now is using gas clathrate inhibitors. So that could be a thermodynamic inhibitor like methanol or even a kinetic uh, clathrate inhibitor like PVP that stands for 
polyvinyl pyrrolidone. And there has since um, recently been a shift towards more environmentally friendly inhibitors, and that's where antifreeze proteins come in. So AFPs, antifreeze proteins, have actually been tested as pretty effective gas clathrate inhibitors to prevent that pipeline clogging. And so these could be called the green clathrate inhibitor. And AFPs come in all shapes and sizes. Um, uh, the type 1 AFP is most interesting for my research. It's this alpha helical, very small uh, protein that's found in the winter flounder fish. There's this type 3 AFP that's a little bit different uh, of a structure, and it's found in the eel pout. And there's this mole, uh, mealworm beetle TM AFP that's a beta solenoid shape. And the purpose of all of these AFPs uh, in these organisms is to bind to nucleating ice crystals to allow these organisms to um, survive at sub-zero temperatures. So it doesn't allow the crystal to grow larger. As you saw, AFPs are structurally diverse. Um, they're also very evolutionarily diverse. So here's a tree of life. And all of these symbols represent, <clears throat> excuse me, represent different structures. So they're found in fish, insects, plants, bacteria, et cetera. Pretty impressive. And the way these things work is that the prote uh, proteins represented as little red dots lowers the freezing point and slightly elevates the melting point. And that's because when the proteins bind near each other on one plane of the ice crystal, uh, a localized curvature will occur, uh, and that makes it less thermodynamically favorable to add more ice onto, uh, so that lowers the freezing point. And it was that alpha helical protein, the type 1 AFPs, that were found to inhibit gas clathrates most effectively out of all the AFPs. And this image is of a molecular dynamics uh, study um, simulation showing that it's the dependent methyl groups of this threonine alanine alanine motif that actually gets inserted into the empty half cages of methane clathrate. Um, so we know that there are uh, ice dwelling organisms that have evolved ice binding proteins and there are microbes living in gas clathrates. So our question is, do these microbes produce gas clathrate binding protein. So our hypothesis is that bacterial proteins from methane clathrate bearing sediment metagenomes are optimized for binding to gas clathrates, and we would call these clathrate binding proteins. So we have sequenced microbial DNA from clathrate bearing sediment cores off the coast of Oregon here in Hydrate Ridge and off the coast of Japan in the Shimokita Peninsula. And we have uh, metagenomic data, which is, if you don't know, DNA from the entire microbial community. And we found that those type 1 AFPs, those short alpha helical proteins, were top hits to a few of our um, these bacterial proteins. So we chose a few of those proteins to express recombinantly uh, with EGFP via E. coli. Um, and we formed a type of clathrate, not methane clathrate yet, but a structure 2 clathrate, um, tetrahydrofuran or THF clathrate, in the presence of our putative clathrate binding proteins. And we did this by machining this drainage capable beaker, and we formed THF clathrate crystals in the presence of um, different protein treatments. And then we extracted the remaining solution after the clathrate crystal had formed, and we're left with a beautiful crystal. So we tested a salt solution that all the other proteins were suspended in. Um, and then we tested negative controls, including cytochrome C and the EGFP, the green fluorescent protein by itself, because all of the CBPs were um, expressed with a green fluorescent protein. And then our positive control is the type 1 AFP, and of course our, our CBPs, clathrate binding proteins. And what we found is that with the green fluorescent protein just by itself, 
we got a THF clathrate crystal that looks like it grew with nothing else. It's beautiful. It's a cubic octahedron. Uh, and then when we shine blue light on it, it did not fluoresce, indicating that the EGFP did not bind because that's the wavelength at which EGFP fluoresces. Whereas the type 1 AFP had a uh, wildly different morphology. It's more plate-like. Um, it's going in different directions. And we think that's because the AFP is binding to like one or two of the different planes of the clathrate, forcing growth in one or two directions. And then CBP3 uh, with the EGFP and without the EGFP resulted in a very similar morphology. And when we shined light on the EGFP version, uh, it did fluoresce, indicating that the protein did indeed bind. So now we can call them clathrate binding proteins for sure, no longer putative. And next we grew met, uh, methane clathrate in the presence of those CBPs. But to do this, we had to machine a high pressure cell. And it is, it looks like this. Um, it is made of stainless steel. It has a sapphire window so that we can observe a methane clathrate shell growing on a treatment droplet. We have some valves to control pressure, um, some transducers to monitor pressure and temperature throughout the entire duration of the experiment. And to nucleate the hydrate, the cl methane clathrate, I increased the pressure to five megapascals and left that for a couple hours. And then I decreased using uh, dry ice, the temperature down to about negative 10 degrees Celsius or whenever the clathrate nucleated. And we tested the PBS salt solution and cytochrome C as negative controls. The type one AFP and actually the PVP, which is the commercial inhibitor as our positive controls and of course our CBPs. So we actually calculated gas consumption during depressurization, and all this means is that um, it, it, it's basically indicative of how much clathrate was formed. And to calculate this, we plotted pressure on the y-axis against temperature, and it is an endothermic process when um, clathrate melts, and so the thermocouple will read a decrease in temperature. So we basically note when melting visually began by this blue arrow. And then as we're depressurizing, uh, the temperature decreases. And then we have a melting peak or whenever visual melting ends. And so that's our second point. And from there, we can calculate, based on these two points, gas consumption. We also looked at morphology. And so this is a droplet before clathrate forms. You can see it's pretty clear, uh, transparent, and a little bit reflective, whereas after clathrate forms, it's no longer uh, reflective and it's opaque. And so here I'm going to share with you the gas consumption data. So gas consumed is on the x-axis, and all the different treatments are on the y-axis. Um, <clears throat> And so this is all, uh, each individual dot represents a trial. And that gray oval just rep uh, is showing the spread of the data per treatment. And so what we found here was that PBS, cytochrome, and type 1 AFP pretty much um, lied in the, laid in like the same region of gas consumed. And so we would say that type 1 AFP did not inhibit methane clathrate, at least at the conditions we used, which was 5 megapascals and negative 10 degrees Celsius. Whereas PVP, which is the commercial inhibitor, did inhibit methane clathrate. There was way less gas consumed here. And then the CBPs. Um, also inhibited methane clathrate uh, quite a bit better than the type 1 AFP. And so we tested CBP number two, three, five, and six. And they pretty much uh, were in the same area as PVP. And, and we would say that CBP three worked probably the best. Um, this is actually a lower concentration of that protein. And it's lying exactly where we would expect it to be uh, between the full concentration and our negative controls.
And in terms of morphology, uh, PBS, cytochrome, and the type 1 AFP treatments resulted in this more cratered morphology. It had a dip in the center of the droplet, whereas PVP and the CBPs, a lot of acronyms, sorry about that, uh, have this dome shape. And I have a little schematic for why we think this is happening. Uh, so here's the droplet before clothrates formed, uh, zero hours. And <clears throat> here's the start of clothrate growth where it becomes opaque. And then at the three hour mark, here uh, we have PVP and CVPs, and we think a very thin clothrate shell forms in the presence of those inhibitors. Whereas with the PBS cytochrome type 1 AFP, there's more clathrate growth that actually craters this structure as the internal water is getting converted to clathrate and pulling it up the sides. So in conclusion, our clathrate binding proteins do alter THF clathrate morphology, which is a structure two clathrate, as well as methane clathrate uh, stability and morphology, and that is a structure one clathrate. So the implications of these CBPs is that, one, um, these are pretty extreme environments that are predicted to be on other planetary bodies, and we could potentially use these proteins to search for life elsewhere. Um, also, it has implications for gas hydrate stability, um, and that means climate change because gas clathrates do store gigatons of carbon in the form of the greenhouse gas methane as well as um, using these proteins for uh, these natural gas pipelines. I'd like to acknowledge the NASA Exobiology grant team and our, my funding sources, including the Ocean Science and Engineering PhD Fellowship, as well as the Glass Lab for giving me copious amounts of support during my PhD. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions for Abigail? One second, I'll yep. walk the microphone back. <laughs> hey, so my question is, uh, are these proteins in these microbes that they're found in, are they being secreted out into sort of the bulk material or are they um, inside the cell trying to make sure that they don't like crystallize themselves or something? Um, we don't have evidence for secretion. Um, that's what we believe. There is evidence for other uh, bacteria and algae doing that in ice um, habitats, but we don't have any um, genomic um, evidence for either one. Uh, but we, we would think that these proteins would be secreted. Um, and so basically they would secrete into their surrounding environments and they would bind to the surrounding clathrates and that would maintain sort of a fluid niche space. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you.